Joe Biden, who is apparently president of the United States, has announced in an op-ed that the United States will, quote, provide the Ukrainians with more advanced rocket systems and munitions that will enable them to more precisely strike key targets on the battlefield in Ukraine. But not just in Ukraine, they'll be able to reach Russia. So we are funding a war against mainland Russia. So this is not lost on the Russians. In response, the Russian foreign minister said that move dramatically increases the risk of a direct conflict between the United States and the Russian military. So the question is, where's this going? What is the objective of our funding the Ukrainian government? How will we know when we can stop? Doug McGregor has helped prosecute wars personally. He's a former senior advisor to the Secretary of Defense and a career military officer. We're happy. Doug, thanks so much for coming on. So I guess that's, that's the question that maybe not, not enough people asked over our 20 years in Afghanistan. What is the objective and how will we know when we have achieved it? Well, first of all, this uh, high mobility artillery rocket system the president mentioned is actually a very good system that can deliver a lot of firepower. The problem is we are apparently sending one launcher that has six tubes for six rockets. In addition to that, I don't know how they're going to acquire targets, what level of surveillance or radars they've got. Perhaps they're going to depend on us for space-based surveillance. But I think under the circumstances, given the fact that this is one launcher, not 50, uh, the Russians can probably relax. You know, it's hard when you, when you look at something this ridiculous not to conclude that this is a face-saving measure on the part of the administration that really doesn't want to admit that this war was lost a long time ago. If anything, this is sort of like handing somebody a, a life preserver on the beach just as 100-foot waves and a tsunami are about to crash into them. So this, uh, this is not going to have any impact. It's not going to be a game changer. Interesting. So uh, clearly some people in the administration must know that. What do you think they're thinking? I mean, I think it's fair for the rest of us to ask what's, what's the end game here? What's the point? When will we know when we've achieved the point and we can stop funding the government of Ukraine? To be frank, uh, this administration and the Defense Department have always been several steps behind uh, in their thinking about everything. And I think at this point, they want to find a way to keep this war going as long as possible. They don't want to admit that they were wrong, that they've run a tremendous disinformation campaign. They don't want to admit that they brought the world, particularly Africa, by the way, to the brink of famine because they stopped the export of wheat. Uh, they don't want to talk about any of the things that really matter. They want to focus as much attention as possible on anything that promises to harm Russia. And in the final analysis, Russia is going to come looking pretty good. Uh, Ukraine, on the other hand, is destroyed and is effectively a failed state. Remarkable. Colonel Doug McGregor, one of the very few honest voices on this subject. We're always happy to have you. Thank you very much. Good morning from Athens, Greece. It is around 9 o'clock here on this Thursday morning. And let's do a morning update video. I'm in Sintagma Square. And uh, check out this fountain. Yeah, this fountain is way out of control. There's like water splashing everywhere. Oh, man. This is like an out of control fountain when I'm getting water on me. <laughs> That's hilarious. Anyway, let's, uh, <laughs> I got all splashed on my glasses. Jeez. <laughs> I think they need to like lower the, <laughs> the, the tap a little there. <laughs> oh boy. So let's talk about some, uh, some news. I'm gonna have to sit down for this one because uh, I wanna look at some passages real quick from the Biden um, New York Times op-ed and I want to discuss one of the passages in, uh, in specific in particular all right so this is a good spot to sit down so um, I did my uh, my second update video last night in the early evening and I talked about that Biden op-ed in the New York Times. And uh, one of the comments in, uh, with regards to that video was really interesting. And I think we need to discuss it a bit, just a little bit, because there was the one passage in there that caught my eye, which is uh, when Biden wrote, if you believe that he wrote it, but uh, that one passage that he wrote in this New York Times op-ed which was titled, uh, What America Will Do and Will Not Do in Ukraine. He said in that passage that uh, one of the goals, or it seemed like he said, one of the goals was to inflict pain on Russia. 
to inflict pain on Russia. And uh, the sentence, the entire sentence says, we do not want to prolong the war just to inflict pain on Russia. Now this word just, I want to talk about this word just, because someone in the comments yesterday said, you know, Alex, I think you misread that line. And I think that commenter may be 100% correct, or at least it seems like the person that uh, wrote this, um, this Abed was really, really smart with the word just, using that word just. I think I have the camera too close, too close to me. How's that? And just for, let's just get into what, what, what Biden said. Let's get into the whole statement because I really want everyone's opinion on this because I think this word just can go both ways. And I think this was done on purpose. And I'll tell you why in a sec. So the New York Times op-ed that Biden wrote had the paragraph as President Volodymyr Zelensky of Ukraine has said, ultimately this war will only definitely end through diplomacy. Every negotiation reflects the facts on the ground. We have moved quickly to send Ukraine a significant amount of weaponry and ammunition so it can fight on the battlefield and be in the strongest possible position at the negotiating table. That's why I decided that we will provide the Ukrainians with more advanced rocket systems and munitions that will enable them to more precisely strike targets on the battlefield in Ukraine. And then you have the important line. And this is where we have to discuss and debate. We are not encouraging or enabling Ukraine to strike beyond its borders. We do not want to prolong the war just to inflict pain on Russia. So I am stuck on that word just, and it can go both ways. Initially, last night in the evening i read this at as we are not we do not want to prolong to prolong the war just to inflict pain on russia in other words we don't want to prolong this but we want to inflict pain on russia we we prefer diplomacy but we're going to send weapons like biden says in the previous paragraphs i read but we're going to send these Harimar weapons, and we're going to send these munitions and all these things to inflict pain on Russia so that we can get Russia to the negotiating table and the collective West has leverage on Russia at the uh, negotiations. But there's another way to read this. You can read this as we do not want to prolong the war just to inflict pain on Russia. In other words, Biden could be saying in this op-ed, our goal is not to prolong the war so that we only inflict pain on Russia. The one, the one interpretation, the interpretation that I, uh, that I analyzed yesterday and that everyone is talking about is a hawkish interpretation, i.e. we're gonna send all these weapons to Ukraine, which supposedly will be a game changer. They're not, but let's just pretend these are going to be a game changer so that we can inflict damage on Russia and we can inflict pain on Russia. That's the one interpretation. The other interpretation is we are not, our goal is not to prolong the war in order to inflict pain on Russia. It's a more dovish approach. So one is a hawkish approach. One is a more diplomatic, dovish approach when you look at the word just. We are not encouraging or enabling Ukraine to strike beyond its borders. We do not want to prolong the war just to inflict pain on Russia. Our goal is not to prolong the war just so we only inflict pain on Russia. Our goal in prolonging the war is to get to a negotiation, to get to a settlement. That's the dovish approach. The other way you can read it is, we do not want to prolong the war, we just want to inflict pain on Russia. In other words, 
our goal is maximum pain on Russia in order to extract concessions during uh, a negotiation. Because Biden says it in the opening paragraph, he says, we only def definitively end through diplomacy. The war will only definitively end through diplomacy. So in this op-ed, there's no doubt that the US for the first time, I believe, is, is saying, look, diplomacy is the only way out of this. We've lost, we've lost the military war. And I think someone who wrote this line, the just line, just to inflict pain on Russia, I believe they, uh, they wrote it like that on purpose because on the one side, it, it appeases the hawks in, uh, in the swamp, in DC, in the Senate, in the Congress, in the Biden White House. So all these hawks say, okay, Joe Biden in this op-ed for the New York Times has said that uh, the goal is not only to prolong the war, but to inflict pain on Russia. And that is why we are going to send these weapons because these weapons will hopefully inflict pain on Russia. But this just word also appeases the, uh, the people in the Biden White House who are saying that this thing is over, this thing is a disaster, let's not get sucked into, uh, into a wider conflict with Russia, let's end this. We've got uh, bigger fish to, fish to fry, we've got problems at home. I'm sure you have a lot of generals in, uh, and military men in the Pentagon who are saying, look, this is not winnable. This is a, a losing proposition. Let's get the hell out of this. And so Biden is, is saying with this sentence, he's saying that the U.S.'s goal is not about inflicting pain on Russia. This is not just about inflicting pain on Russia. This is not what this is about. And prolonging the war is not about inflicting pain on Russia. Prolonging the war by sending these weapons is about trying to get to the negotiating table and getting a peaceful settlement. So anyway, I want to hear your thoughts on this sentence. I'll read it one more time. How do you see the word just? And really look at the statement, really give it some thought because I think this, this could go both ways. And, uh, and the person that wrote this was quite uh, the wordsmith. So Biden is, is quite a man with, uh, with words. He really knows how to use the, uh, and command the English language, we are not encouraging or enabling Ukraine to strike beyond its borders. We do not want to prolong the war just to, inf just to inflict pain on Russia, or we do not want to prolong, to prolong the war, just inflict pain on Russia. So anyway, I, I wanted to clarify that uh, the video that I did yesterday evening with some more thought and analysis. I just wanted to kind of uh, to just talk to everyone about how, how this comment really got me curious and really got me thinking about that line. And I don't think it was, uh, it was an accident that, that it was phrased like this. I think it's ambiguous for, uh, for a reason because it, uh, it pleases both sides. Let me know what you think in the comments down below and let's get to some more stories here. So Hungary has come out with a statement and they have said that they have received many, many concessions from the EU and that is why they went along with the oil embargo and the, the eventual sixth round of, uh, of EU sanctions against Russia. Specifically, Hungary said something that I thought was very interesting. Not only is uh, the Druzba pipeline not going to be sanctioned and not going to be embargoed, but Hungary also said that if there are disruptions to the Druzba pipeline, the pipeline from Russia that passes through Ukraine and feeds Hungary with its oil. If there are disruptions to this pipeline, i.e. the Alensky regime decides to perhaps cut it off like they did a couple of weeks ago with another pipeline. If there are disruptions, then the EU has uh, assured Hungary that they'll be able to get oil via sea transport without even talking about embargoes or sanctions or any of that stuff. Otherwise, uh, other words, Hungary has said that they have been assured by the EU that no matter what happens, they will get Russian oil, whether it's via the pipeline or if Alensky does, some, so does something crazy 
and decides to shut down that pipeline, like he has already done, then the EU guarantees oil to Hungary via sea transport. So Hungary has uh, come out of this uh, deal with the oil embargo uh, very, very well. They have received assurances. Can you trust the EU? No, but I'm sure that Hungary is going to make sure that uh, they get everything signed and, uh, and in place before they agree to, to go along with the sixth round of, uh, of sanctions because they got a vote on this sixth round of sanctions. It's not a done deal yet. All the countries, all 27 members have to sit down and approve it and vote on it. So I'm sure Hungary's going to say, okay, you guys promised us the Ruzba pipeline is not going to be touched. And you promised if Zelensky goes crazy and decides to, uh, to turn off the, the taps, so to speak, of the Druzba, then you promise that we're going to get oil via sea and there, there are going to be no disruptions to Hungary's oil supply. So I thought that was really interesting. On a side note, we are seeing the, uh, the EU start to really um, buckle with these... Uh, this oil embargo. In other words, they're starting to walk back a lot of their tough talk because they're starting to get a feeling, the kleptocrats in Brussels, that a lot of EU countries are going to try and find ways to circumvent the, uh, the oil embargo. And they're coming out with statements now saying that uh, should countries not abide, EU countries not abide by the oil embargo and the eventual sixth round of, uh, of sanctions against Russia, then the EU, according to the Financial Times, is preparing backup plans, including import tariffs on Russian crude. The EU is reportedly considering imposing import tariffs on Russian crude if any members of the bloc refuse to implement the terms of the newly announced embargo on oil from the country, the FT reported on Wednesday. <laughs> so on the one hand, if you resist and you're firm in your resistance with regards to approving the oil embargo and the sanctions, you're going to get uh, all kinds of concessions carved out to you like Hungary has done and well done Hungary. You stood firm and you benefited. But if you just go along with the, uh, with the sanctions and you then try to you know, find a sneaky way to circumvent the oil embargo, then the EU is just going to uh, impose tariffs on, uh, on Russian oil. What a, th 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 this policy is just so wacko. It's so uh, poorly thought out. It's a disaster. It's not going to work. It's a complete disaster. And uh, I think in six to 12 months time, the only thing this, uh, this oil embargo, this pretend oil embargo is going to do is that it's going to punish EU citizens. That's all it's going to do. It's just going to make the economic situation in Europe a hundred times worse. <laughs> that is all it's going to do. This thing is going to cause so many distortions in the market and it's just so, so poorly thought out. There is no consistency. There's no, uh, there's no logic to it at all and now they're talking about imposing tariffs if countries decide to uh import russian oil what a mess what a freaking mess this is uh this is becoming and it's just going to get worse so we have that story and um i want to talk a little bit about hunter hunter biden but first let me just do a quick update with the story i also did yesterday with regards to the tank swap because uh, the tank swap is also looking like it's going to be a complete mess. I, I did a video about a week ago how Poland is, has done this tank swap before, or they're preparing this tank swap, this weapons swap with Germany, and uh, how the Polish government is now saying, you know what, we've sent a bunch of weapons to Ukraine, but Germany has still not given us the weapons that uh, they promised because we sent weapons to Ukraine. And then you had the German government saying, you know what, we don't have these weapons handy, and it's going to actually take time for us to uh to make these weapons so you're gonna have to wait a couple of years and poland is now saying a couple of years you know we already sent our weapons and our tanks to ukraine we need we need new tanks now and so we already have seen this this formula kind of backfire and uh, we're now starting to get reports from uh from the german defense uh ministry that uh the weapons that they're promising ukraine these these uh anti 
these anti-air defense systems that they're promising to get to Ukraine. I think Iris, what are they called? Iris T's, I believe, defense systems that uh, Germany doesn't have any of these. <laughs> they just simply can't get these to Ukraine. And the weapons that they're going to provide Greece for the tank swap that Greece is going to uh, do with Germany, they don't have these, uh, these weapons either. And I think they're going to provide, not tanks, but they're going to provide like uh, artillery, like vehicles and stuff like that. And uh, the German uh, defense ministry is saying, we don't have anything to give uh, Greece either. So Greece is like, well, okay, we're going to send our old uh, Soviet tanks to Ukraine and we're just going to wait a couple of years to get our uh, weapons in return from Germany. So the whole thing is looking like it's going to be a complete disaster as well for all parties involved. I have to say this, this whole tank swap thing is just so sneaky. It really is. I, I just don't like anything about it. It's like, you know, uh, it's like a drug dealer going to someone else and saying, you know what, I don't want to deal these drugs, but why don't I give you these drugs and then you can uh, sell these drugs and I'm just going to kind of stay out of the picture and I'll, I'll reward you on, on the back end. <laughs> you know, the whole thing is just so, it's just so sneaky. I don't like it at all. You know, if you want to get weapons to Ukraine, Greece, if you want to send weapons to Ukraine, just man up and send weapons to Ukraine and just tell Russia, you know what, Russia, we're going to arm Ukraine. What are you going to do about it? You know, if you want to be tough and act tough and support Ukraine, then just come out of the shadows and do it instead of doing all of these, these sneaky little tank swaps. And the same goes for Germany. If you want to... Uh, if you want to arm Ukraine and stand up to the evil Putin and be tough about it, then send weapons to Ukraine. Get involved. Face Russia face to face. If you're if you're so hell bent on uh, sticking it to Putin, but this whole I'm gonna send, I'm gonna I'm gonna tell Greece to send old Soviet tanks to Ukraine and then Greece will be able to get weapons from us and we'll be able to get weapons to Greece and. This will, uh, this will um, shield NATO from being involved in the conflict. And all. it's just so, it's, it's so cowardly. You know, it, that's the way I look at it. I'm not saying that I want a wider war. I don't want a wider war. I don't want a NATO war with Russia. I don't want any of these things. My point in all of this is that the leaders in Europe are just such sneaky cowards. And they talk so tough and they lecture Russia, and they badmouth Putin, and they do all of these things. But when push comes to shove, and uh, it's time to face Putin and to face Russia, like to actually face them, to man up, step outside and face them, what do they do? Oh, well, you know, let's uh, do this little tank swap, and let's get tanks to Greece, and Greece can then send tanks to Ukraine, and, you know, we can do this whole little uh, song and dance, and... And then Russia, well, Russia can't blame us. We're not involved in the war. We didn't have anything to do with, with the war because we kind of did this whole little weapons laundering scheme. Anyway, it just kind of, uh, I just find the whole thing to be really just weak, really weak. I would have more respect for, uh, I'll speak for Greece since I'm in Greece right now. I would have more respect for the Greek government, for the Mitsotakis. If he stood up and he said, you know, Germany, I don't want to do any tank swaps. I stand with Ukraine. I don't like Putin. I don't like Russia. So I'm going to send weapons to Ukraine. How about that, Putin? What do you think of that, Sergei uh, Shoigu? What do you think of that, Lavrov? If he said that, I would say you're crazy. <laughs> you're absolutely crazy. And uh, you don't know what you're doing. But at least, you know, you've got balls. I would say that. At least you've got balls. <laughs> that, that I would say is uh, is okay. <laughs> I would have more respect for the Greek government if they did that instead of, you know, doing all of these these harebrained little little schemes that they're concocting in uh, the EU and in NATO. Anyway, let's get to our clown world. And this clown world has to deal with Elensky's wife, who is, uh, according to the Daily Mail, says that their nine-year-old son gives the president his president, father advice on military matters. 
Alensky's wife says she speaks openly about the war with her children, and their nine-year-old son gives his father advice on military matters. So uh, Olena Alensky was giving a, a press conference, and she was talking to the media, and she said that she talks about the war with her two children, uh, Alexandra, 17, and Kirillo, nine years old. And then she said that uh, Kirillo actually gives advice to uh, his father, to Alensky, on military matters. And now, let's go for a walk. Let's walk here and talk about this story. Now, Alensky, Olena, Lena Zelensky, I understand why she gave this press conference, and I understand why she is saying this about uh, her son. She's trying to, once again, pre create a narrative and to to gain sympathy from, uh, from the media and to say, isn't that cute and that's sweet and look at this family that's, uh, that's been separated and Olena with the kids is, is in a town. I believe she said she's in a town uh, close to, uh, to the border to the western border of uh, Ukraine, I believe she said with, uh, I'm not sure, with Hungary? I'm not sure where she said she is, but anyway, she's towards the the west, deep in the west. And, uh, you know, Alensky, she said, is, is dealing with the war and fighting this war and trying to keep the country together. So I understand the sentiment of this clown world story, but it's clown world because you know that there are going to be soldiers in the front line who are going to get a hold of this article. And they're just going to sit there and they're going to say, what the F is going on? Because it just sounds a little bit crazy. Actually, it sounds very crazy. So they're trying to win media points, the Alenskis, which is what they do. That's what they're good at is media, media spin. I believe she's an actress. Alensky is an actor. Obviously, we all know that, the clown puppet actor. But... Um, you know, they're trying to get media points, but I don't think they recognize that what this does to many of the soldiers fighting the war on the front line is that this is demoralizing because they're going to read this and say, all right, so uh, here's the president's wife talking about the war with her nine-year-old uh, kid. And the nine-year-old then gives advice to uh, his dad. And what if his dad actually is influenced by the nine-year-old. What if he says, you know, that's not a bad idea, uh, Kirillo. That's actually pretty interesting. I mean, it, it just, I understand what they wanted to do, but it just sent the wrong message to the uh, Ukraine soldiers who are on the front line and it kind of backfires. That's why this is a clown world story. But I definitely understand what they were looking to do. And uh, it makes sense because they're losing on all fronts. The Alensky regime is losing on all fronts. And a lot of people in the collective West just aren't that interested in the Ukraine war anymore. It's not on the front pages anymore. It's not the lead story anymore in, uh, in the news cycle. And they're trying everything they can, the Alensky regime, to try and, uh, and get attention. And he's an actor. I believe she's an actress. They understand the media. They understand spin. They understand how to craft, or at least they think they understand how to craft interesting, compelling, sympathetic stories to try, to try and get attention and spotlight back onto them. And um, this story, I think, was a miss. This was a miss. It's not going to play well to those who are fighting the, uh, the war. But... Um, you know, Lensky, one final thought, I'm sure Lensky, you know, he, he does the media and he does the spin and that's what he's uh, good at, him and his team. But I'm sure they're just, uh, there are days where they're sitting back and they're saying to themselves, Lensky and Aristovich and all of these producers and directors that are in his cabinet, they're probably sitting back sometimes when they're sober and they're saying, how the hell did we end up in this mess? I thought we were just going to be Kolomoisky's puppets. I thought that uh, Igor Kolomoisky was just going to give us a couple of billion. We were going to be his stand-in puppets as, uh, as the president of Ukraine and the administration of Ukraine. And then 
Igor was going to run the country. How the hell did we end up in this mess? I wonder if they ask themselves this. I'm sure every now and then, Alensky kind of sits there and ponders, how did I get, get in this mess? I was, just go I was just playing a part. I was just the main actor in the television show, Servant for the People. I never thought that Kolomoisky's plan would land me in this mess. I am positive that Alensky and his team, every now and then, sit there and just kind of say, it was just a television show. It was just a television show. And look at where it uh, has led. Anyway, we will end the video there, everybody. Check out Alexander's channel. Check out uh, the Duran main channel and go to the duran.locals.com. Take care from Central Athens.